Hi, everyone. <coughs> I hope you're enjoying your HashiConf. Oh, sorry, Hashi days. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's probably one of the coolest uh, intros I got since I've been public speaking, so thanks for that. <laughs> Cheers. And yeah, by the way, your code worked perfectly <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, uh, so what we're going to talk about today is uh, we're going to cover uh, two of my favorite topics, which is uh, security and infrastructure as a code. And it really warms my heart to hear, uh, you know, of likes of Zurich that we heard just now. Uh, they're using things like Terraform Cloud, and they're aware of different kind of uh, security approaches you need to take uh, using infrastructure as that. So without further ado, let's just dive into it. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, <coughs> kind of graphics and uh, uh, kind of uh, information here. Uh, so coincidentally, that kind of aligns nicely, uh, nicely with what we heard this morning uh, with the keynote. So I'm really glad to hear that uh, you know my research kind of uh, <laughs> showed the same thing that the uh, uh, state of the cloud from HashiCorp kind of revealed as well. As well. And uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I actually kind of looked at some of the kind of research out there. Specifically, I looked at the Gartner and Sneak support, uh, and just tried to see you know when the industry where the industry is going and what the kind of major concerns are going forward. And if you look at the Gartner research, uh, luckily the cloud is still on the rise, so obviously we are in the right room and right industry. Uh, but what's more important here is actually the security is still number one, kind of, uh, sorry, still number two concern with 78% uh, for most of the companies in the cloud. And uh, on the kind of other side of the spectrum, if you look at the research from Sneak, they actually found out that. Uh, more than, I think, 80% of the organizations uh, have actually seen a major or significant security incident uh, during their cloud journey. So it's quite a worrying information that you're seeing, right? So uh, uh, even though it's a really nice way of you know, scaling up your company, getting your product out in front of your customers, it's still a couple of things you need to take care of uh, as you kind of onboard this, uh, this journey. And if you kind of quickly just break it down a bit, uh, you know, if we look at this kind of a graph here, uh, one of the major cloud incidents that people would see is actually caused by, I don't know if you can see that, it's by downtown due misconfiguration, and that's 34%. And if you kind of break it down even more, it's usually something like IMS configuration or object storage misconfiguration, insecure API keys, and all the kind of good things, right? Uh, so even though you know this is kind of a well-known fact, and we're all aware of this, we still do that, right? Like, can I get a raise of hands? Who ever done that or seen that in the past? Yeah, yeah, a lot of you. So you know, uh, <laughs> even though security is important, we still kind of try to kind of take a lot of shortcuts and maybe try to get things uh, uh, deployed quicker and try to increase the velocity, even though it might not be the most secure way of doing it. So. So uh, maybe just kind of a takeaway from here would be at this point, uh, we're going to dive into the kind of detail later, but security through obscurity should never be the only security mechanism you have. So even though you're putting your key under the doormat, uh, people will still get around that and find it out eventually. Uh, maybe just kind of tripping on it, something. Uh, so quickly, something about me. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Marco. I work as a head of consultancy at the Scale Factory. We are the AWS consultancies kind of focusing on SaaS B2B businesses. Uh, and um, um, I have a strong ops background, so I wore different hats through my career, uh, everything from sysops all the way to consultancy now. And uh, during my career, I've seen things as well. So. Uh, <laughs> I hope that kind of qualifies me to kind of maybe share some of our experience and also you know, uh, what to kind of watch out for in the cloud native space, specifically around security. I'm also an open source contributor. Uh, you can find me uh, in a lot of projects. And I'm a maintainer of a few as well, so such as Argo CD, Helm Charts. Uh, and uh, I'm also a HashiCorp ambassador. So uh, we are a friendly bunch of people. There are a couple of us around here. So we are definitely help. Uh, kind of happy to help you with any questions that you might have around the technology as well. Uh, when I'm not pressing the uh, little plastic squares, uh, what I also like to do is I like hiking and traveling as well, uh, which I can actually do that now more of. And yeah, please feel to reach out through any of the social platforms if you'd like. Uh, I'm probably most active on Twitter. Uh, uh, that's still around, I guess. And if you're on the other ones, uh, that works as well. Right, so let's have a quick look. Uh, um, 
what the agenda looks like for today, what we're going to kind of have a look at, and what we're going to cover. So we're going to initially start with Terraform workflows. Um, so we're going to start quite on a kind of a fundamental level, just to kind of set the scene first. Then we're going to have a uh, look where you know sensitive values can come from, where you can store those. Uh, what the attack vectors are, what potential threats are, storing sensitive values at different points. Uh, we're going to look at some remediation and prevention, and um, I'm going to wrap it up at the end with some takeaways uh, uh, afterwards. So let's have a quick look at the workflows then. So as it was kind of mentioned throughout the day multiple times already, uh, uh, obviously you can run your Terraform using the OSS binary, so that would be a really simple workflow of running Terraform uh, in your pipeline somewhere, or using any kind of wrappers, um, I think we heard uh, probably Terragrant or something like that earlier. Uh, then obviously we have Terraform Cloud, um, kind of the, uh, you know, the, the, at least my favorite kind of platform out there currently. Uh, and we can kind of split workloads uh, and, and kind of three, three kind of basic ones uh, and during, uh, if you're using Terraform Cloud during runs. So you can run your Terraform as a VCS driven run, uh, which means it's, it's triggered by your code in your version control system. Uh, you can actually use the CLI type, uh, which is literally using Terraform Cloud just as the backend. Then the API, which requires a little bit more kind of tooling on your end. Uh, and all of those can actually elevate and use the, uh, the secrets available through Terraform Cloud or any kind of, ha any kind of other hashes stack kind of tooling out there. And obviously, uh, you know, if you operate in cloud native space uh, and you know Kubernetes is uh, your game of the name of the game, uh, you can definitely go for the Terraform Kubernetes operator. Uh, to be fair, I haven't heard a lot about that lately, but it's an interesting way how you can actually provision your workspaces through SRDs, so uh, um, and then kind of run your Terraform within that as well. Uh, if you're kind of more inclined to use uh, uh, kind of structured uh, um, programming languages uh, or procedural, program procedural programming languages, you might actually go with CDKTF. Um, uh, and that gives you the opportunity to use kind of strongly typed types such as Golang, C Sharp, or TypeScript. Uh, and that gives you opportunity to store your secrets kind of in a slightly different way as well. Uh, for example, like with Terraform or Kubernetes operator, you can store it as Kubernetes secrets, or as we've seen earlier, uh, using the Vault operator, which kind of syncs the secrets between your secret managers and uh, your Terraform, uh, sorry, uh, Kubernetes clusters. And there are third-party kind of tools as well, such as Atlantis, M0, Scalar, Spacelift, etc., like the likes of those. Uh, right, so let's have a quick look at the workflow architecture. I'm not gonna dwell on that too much. I'm sure most of you are familiar how that kind of looks like. Uh, so, um, best to kind of look it through the o o open source kind of a workflow. Uh, it's kind of similar to what you would get out of Terraform Cloud with kind of additional functionality. But uh, if we kind of break it down and kind of look where the inflection points are, is uh, you would usually have your code stored somewhere in your um, most typically uh, uh, Git repo. Uh, then, uh, as soon as you trigger your Terraform run, you would kind of initialize your modules, providers, uh, kind of do the planning and then applying and kind of provisioning that in your uh, uh, through your um, cloud providers. Um, and the secrets can actually come from the cloud providers. You can have it in code, I hope not, uh, and kind of uh, external systems as well. Uh, but let's kind of dive into those uh, right now. <clears throat> so if we have a look at sensitive values and threats uh, using Terraform specifically, is uh, where can those actually kind of come from or live? Uh, we can kind of break it down in four major areas. So first of all, in order to run your Terraform, you need to authenticate with your backend, with your provider. So obviously, you need to use provider tokens for that. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the execution authentication that you're doing. Uh, then obviously, uh, specific resources would require you to set initial secrets or initial passwords, such as you know databases, and those can live hard coded as passwords in HCL, uh, or you know you can refer to them as the API keys. Uh, then slightly less obvious one is logs and outputs. So if you know if you're using your uh, Terraform runs as part of your pipelines. Uh, you know, uh, sensitive values might actually be emitted as part of the output and logs, uh, and that might be a potential kind of uh, attack vector as well for people that have access to logs but might not necessarily have access to resources provisioning. 
And then the last one, and probably the most important, is the state content and uh, access to the state as well. So it's not just about the content of the state, but also ensuring that people uh, that have access to state uh, are probably kind of uh, controlled and you're using the least privileged access for, that, uh, for those resources as well. Uh, so let's have a quick look at uh, um, some code samples and how uh, we can actually kind of use those. So we start with the provider tokens. <laughs> like I mentioned, uh, this is a very kind of simplistic example of using the AWS provider. So uh, in order to access that, you can provide or you need to provide access keys and uh, secret access keys. And that can either live as part of the HCL, as I mentioned, uh, or you can kind of inject that as part of your environment or external variables, right? And uh, don't get me wrong, that can be stored securely as well. So it's not necessarily wrong to kind of use environmental variables or kind of inject them from other environments. But like we heard earlier, and uh, it's really good to see that my presentation is actually matching what we heard so far. The next kind of uh, improvement on that would definitely be using something like dynamic provider credentials using um, uh, OCD, uh, OpenID uh, connector protocol. Uh, I'm not going to dive into that into detail. We've seen a lot of kind of graphics in the previous presentation, as well as there is a more in detail workshop following, uh, I think, a couple of sessions this afternoon. So if you're interested in that, definitely attend that. Uh, but uh, the main kind of advantage and improvement uh, you know, um, versus uh, static keys is not just that you don't have to provide the keys, but you are avoiding using the long-lived keys. And that's kind of the, I think, the strong point using the dynamic credentials. And you, know, uh, you can use it in a similar way that you use with keys. Uh, the only difference is, as Kyle showed us earlier, is there is literally nothing you can you need to hide. You just need to specify a role arm, session name, uh, and identity token if that's the um, the approach you're having, and you can just apply your code and kind of automatically works, right? Uh, and uh, the key bit is you kind of need to establish the trust relationship between your Terraform execution environment on one end and the IAM identity provider on the other end. So if you're using AWS provider, that would be AWS IAM. And uh, Terraform Cloud supports that as well now, obviously, as we heard. So uh, in a similar way, you can inject that as part of the, your uh, Terraform uh, Cloud workflow. So uh, let's uh, quickly have a look at some code. Uh, so normally, my presentations would have demos. But this time, unfortunately, no demos. But we will be looking at some code, at least. Uh, so if we look at this really simple example, it's um, it's slightly less simple than I wanted, but nevertheless. So like I mentioned before, if you're provisioning something like AWS DB instance, you obviously need to provide initial admin username and password. And if you were to store that you know, in HCL, HCL code, uh, I hope you're not doing that, that would be literally putting the key on the doormat, not underneath. Uh, so I hope you don't do that. But there are other ways to get around it, right? So obviously, you can use variables. and. Uh, I really hope you're not using defaults, but uh, I just wanted to demonstrate that it can either live in your code, or you can actually kind of inject that as part of your run environment using something like Terraform, uh, Terraform variables, like TFRs, or environmental variables as well, if this is part of your, of your workflow. Sorry if you kind of see that. Uh, and since uh, 014, uh, you can also set the sensitive value to true. So uh, there are certain... Um, arguments of the resources, such as in uh, AWS DB instance, uh, that would automatically mark uh, passwords as sensitive. So there is no implicit need of doing that. But if you're using variables, make sure that you mark them as sensitive if this is something you don't want to emit in your outputs. And as we can see in this screen, uh, since we marked uh, uh, the value as sensitive, it would be kind of omitted and masked out in the Terraform run output. So in this case, the password is just marked as sensitive value, and we can't really see you know, um, what's actually said by it. But at this point, the question is, is, is this really enough, right? Like, you know, obviously, you, know, you cannot see that from the Terraform run, but uh, if we have a quick look at the Terraform state, it's just a snippet of that state, so there is more to it. But if you look at the snippet of that state for that DB instance, you're going to see that the password actually stored that as clear text. So um, obviously, even though we're marking, marking that as a sensitive attribute, it's still clear text. And you know, you might ask yourself, like, oh, that's a really weir weird way of storing that. But you know, kind of thinking back, 
in order for Terraform to kind of apply the resources and kind of see if you have drift or if it needs to change anything. Obviously, it needs to have access to that as well. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, we have clear text um, passwords there. But you know, at this point, you must ask yourself, is there anything more we can do? Right? And uh, luckily, there is. Uh, so as you're probably aware, what we can do, we can use something like uh, AWS Secret Manager or Vault or any kind of external secret manager. And uh, in this example, what we're doing, we're just randomizing the password to kind of uh, reduce the humor, uh, human error in terms of people storing the passwords locally on their laptops or, God forbid, post-its. Uh, and we're just kind of feeding that into the secret manager and ingesting that as a resource uh, for the password field and just using the JSON decode to kind of get it from the JSON form that AWS Secrets Manager is returning in this case. So we're using the external password manager now, and passwords are kind of completely uh, stored securely. Everything is nice and fine, right? Uh, we can kind of call it a day. Uh, but uh, let's have a look in the state again. So it's another, an, uh, again, it's a snippet, so it's not a full state. But what I wanted to show you is specifically in this case for the AWS Secrets Manager secret version, it still holds the secret string as a plain text and the reasons are still the same. So even though using an external secrets provider, Terraform needs to be aware of the secret because otherwise it doesn't know, you know, it cannot detect the drift, it cannot provision it on the change, things like that. So we still need to store it like that. So uh, we haven't really sorted it out. And the reason why I wanted to get to this point is I was really surprised you know, when I talked to customers or even when I was preparing for this talk. I was reading a couple of blogs from even like security companies. And a lot of people mention scenario where they say, oh, use the external secrets provider, you know, and you, know, you have everything encrypted. And that's really not true. Uh, the state is still plain text, regardless of what you're doing. So it's definitely good to keep that in mind going forward. Uh, uh, the secret might be encrypted. Uh, you know, on the ingestion point, uh, but the state is still plain text. Right. Uh, before we kind of try to look, you know, what the kind of recommended approach to that is, and probably many of you are kind of, you know, sensing where I'm going with that is, uh, I would really like to pose another question, which is, uh, you know, are there any other other kind of uh, tech vectors or possible threats running your Terraform? Uh, have we really covered it all with those four? And the question is definitely no. Uh, in the world of fast-paced development, you probably heard of a thing called uh, supply chain attacks. So uh, that also applies for your Terraform runs. Uh, so it might apply in kind of um, in a different way regarding which kind of workflow you're using. But definitely, for example, uh, we heard Zurich mentioning before, they're using their private module registry. But for example, if you're using a public module registry, are you sure what kind of code you're ingesting? Or are you pinning your kind of module versions, right? Because you know maybe the upstream gets compromised, or maybe they kind of introduce a functionality that might break or, God forbid, uh, uh, expose your secrets. So definitely something to be aware of going forward. It's not just the, what we already mentioned. And then obviously there are kind of you know binary sources as well. So if you're running Terraform as part of your uh, as part of your uh, pipeline, uh, and you're not using something like Terraform Cloud, you know, are you checking signatures for the binary? Uh, are you checking the provenance? Are you sure where the code is coming from? Like you know, somebody could kind of pretend they're you know uh, uh, the source of your binaries which are you pulling down, or, or you know, if you're upgrading your uh, version of the binary, you know where it's coming from. So something to keep in mind as well. Uh, then obviously there is a dependency injection as well. So if you're using any kind of third party plugins or providers, uh, definitely need, I would definitely urge you to kind of not necessarily check the source code, but at least know where it's coming from uh, and establish some kind of trust in the, in the plugins that you're uh, ingesting. Because as we know, as I mentioned earlier, when you're doing Terraform uh, in it, uh, Obviously, that wouldn't pull in the third-party plugins, so you need to make sure that you're putting them in place. And this is the point when you need to make sure that you know the the sources or artifacts that you're using are secure. Actually, that they're not going to expose you in any other way. And obviously, with all the supply chain attacks, uh, the main aim is usually, at least what we see working with other customers, is uh, 
uh, they can be used to provision additional, additional resources and kind of abuse that in um, any kind of different ways, for example, like Bitcoin mining, or I'm not sure what the, uh, the most popular abuse today is. Uh, or they can actually be used to elevate permissions furthermore. So uh, definitely something to kind of keep in mind going forward. Um, right. Uh, we kind of covered a lot, but uh, I think uh, Rob kind of insinuated earlier uh, something about AI, so I definitely wanted to mention that as well. And the reason why I want to mention that is because we're seeing kind of a big uptick on that. And the first thing I want to say, generative is not intelligent. Keep that in mind. I think this is a common misconception. So even though the code is being generated, it doesn't mean it's correct, it's secure, or it's going to work. So. Uh, something to keep in mind, and uh, even though it's very popular, uh, at least from what we've seen, is usually kind of raises more questions than answers it. So uh, it kind of it can accelerate your path or kind of make development slightly easier, but at the same time you have to be aware of the potential risks or uh, kind of threats coming from from kind of that direction. So for example, you know. Do you know what models? You know uh, what models are being used for your code prediction? You know how they're being trained, what data has been used. I think those are kind of the questions that uh, you know are usually kind of uh, skipped when people kind of see, oh, you know, there is a bunch of code coming out of thin air, and it kind of works right, and it looks about right. So definitely something to keep in mind, and you know. Uh, Obviously, if you're using third party, yeah, uh, make sure that uh, you trust them. You know, uh, their models can be kind of exposed as well. Maybe they have leaks on their own, so that's kind of a thing. And also, uh, what I've seen lately is a lot of prompt injections as well. So people are getting really creative how to ask. You know, uh, things like ChatGPT, how to get things. So if you're training your own models, make sure that definitely don't put secrets in the training uh, the training data. Uh, that's definitely a no go. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so let's have a quick look at the remediation and prevention. So how would we kind of remediate against those things that I've talked about so far? So obviously the first one is use secrets managers. Use things like Vault, use things like KMS, and any kind of um, dedicated secrets management solution out there. Uh, it can store your secrets much more secure than you can on your own, I'm sure of that. And uh, there are a lot of kind of SaaS products out there that can ease up the transition if you're not familiar with those kind of things. I mean, we've seen Vault releasing the Vault secrets now as part of the HTTP platform. So uh, I think that's a really nice way of getting familiar with that if you're not using that already. And obviously, the, all the major cloud providers provide something on their own as well. Uh, when you're uh, creating roles and IAM permissions for your cloud, uh, sorry, for your Terraform execution roles, make sure to use least privilege. Um, when I say that, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to always be uh, full administrator IAM, like, which I see quite often. A lot of people would just go like, oh yeah, administrator access, it works, right? It's fine. Well, you know, do you really need that? Or can you scope it down, maybe using something like IAM boundaries and things like that? Uh, it's it's quite easy to kind of scope it down and limit the kind of the blast radius in case something goes wrong. Then uh, next thing, definitely encrypt your state. We mentioned state earlier, so we're all aware that everything is plain text in it. So if you're using a remote state, definitely make sure that the remote backend is encrypted, addressed. Encryption uh, in transit is automatically ensured by a Terraform, so you don't have to make sure that happens, but at least make sure that uh, the backend is encrypted. Uh, another question there is the content encryption. Uh, we've seen um, uh, we've seen customers, for example, using something like GitCrypt. Uh, I wouldn't say uh, it's the worst thing, but probably not also something I would suggest using. Uh, but it kind of keeps your secrets secure. But it always makes me twitch when somebody says like, "Oh, I'm committing my secrets to Git." Like, mm, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, even though they're using PGP, right? Uh, and obviously, there is a long-standing uh, GitHub issue on Terraform, uh, the famous 9556, open since 2016 on encrypting the Terraform state. And that only proves, uh, issue is still open, by the way, and that only proves that uh, it's a hard problem to solve, right? And there are reasons why it's not encrypted. So, uh, that's why I cannot stress enough to encrypt the backend. So moving on. Uh, 
definitely I would suggest using kind of a, a company-wide governance in terms of setting up policies and setting up guardrails for people provisioning things. We heard during the previous talk, they're kind of deploying things using the uh, the, the 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 landing zone across the across their estate, uh, which is definitely a, a, a something that we would suggest as well. And uh, while working with customers, this is something that would give you the best kind of uh, control and uh, um, central governance over your uh, estate. Uh, there are solutions for that, like uh, Sentinel, obviously, uh, the native uh, the native HashiCorp tool, and then the OPA, which is also part of the Hashi, uh, Hashi, uh, Hashi tooling as well. So you can use it using Terraform Cloud now as well. Uh, definitely use code scanning. I was really glad to hear that during previous talk as well. So when you're kind of pushing your code through, even pre-commit, uh, pre make sure that you're using tools such as Chekhov, TFSec, TerraScan, etc. Like there was all valid tools, uh, tools that would kind of raise up issues early on. So uh, it kind of all aligns with the, uh, the general kind of shift left security kind of mantra. So uh, I would definitely recommend using those. Um, then, like mentioned earlier, uh, make sure that you use trusted sources for your artifacts, such as binaries or like uh, you know modules and things like that, and uh, make sure that you're pinning versions. Like you wouldn't believe how many uh, how many modules I see people using without version pinning. It's just like, or they're using pessimistic pinning, and they think that's fine, and uh, until it's not. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yes. Uh, Something like Terraform Cloud or HTTP, I think it ticks a lot of boxes. So the reason why I'm suggesting that constantly is not just because I'm HashiCorp ambassador, but also I think it gives you a really nice streamlined workflow and kind of sets you up for success early on on your journey. So regardless where you are in the kind of your journey or your uh, cloud adoption story, I think this is a really good foundation to start with. And uh, it kind of manages the whole life cycle for your infrastructure as a code as well, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and we're kind of getting there in time. Uh, perfect. So just to kind of wrap it up, uh, we didn't talk about securing your infrastructure as such. Uh, it's an important topic, uh, not something we're covering today, but also worth keeping in mind. But if there is anything I would like you to kind of live with from this talk is this. Protect your crown jewels, uh, and those are definitely uh, state safekeeping. Make sure that it's encrypted. Secrets manager, streamline workflows, central governance, and avoid long-lived keys using things like OADC. Um, yeah, don't be the person hiding your secrets under the floor mat. Thank you. Hope you're going to join the rest of the conference.